Sometimes, if you look at you know, some young people nowadays, that even physically they are not strong. And then you ask them, What kind of food have you been eating? And then they'll tell you, I love this chocolate, I love the sweets, I love this, I love that. And that's why some teenagers are even having diabetes even now. And they're having this and that. And you wonder, is old people that normally should have that kind of sickness? What are you eating? The same thing spiritually. If we're just taking, you know, some stuff that is just to entertain us and just to whip off our emotion during the service, Sunday after Sunday, we'll be weak. We'll not be strong. If we're going to be strong, we need to take the balanced diet of the Word of God. That's what has weakened many churches, not standing upon the Word and just get almost into the entertainment industry and entertaining people when they come to church but if the church is going to be strong if the membership of the church is going to be strong it's going to be based upon the undiluted word of god look at that verse 14 again the second part it says i've written unto you young men because you are strong and the word of god does what abideth in you and ye have overcome the wicked one that's a victorious life the triumphant life we're getting a perception of what the triumphant life is all about it's an overcoming life a life that overcomes evil that overcomes sin sin of every description in first john chapter 3 first john chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 5 and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins once again remember not to excuse our sins not just to cover up our sins not to make light of our sins not to leave us in our sins he came he was manifested in fact the angel said thou shall call his name jesus because he shall save his people from what? From their sins. Have we forgotten that's the very reason why Christ came? Why has the church, I don't mean this church now, the church as a whole, the church all over the world, why are we forsaken the goal, the reason why he came? You've heard about uh, Nigeria, you've heard about Africa. I think when uh, Dr. Osgood was speaking yesterday, he mentioned, uh, you know, the church growing in Nigeria. I wasn't here, but I know what he's likely to say because, you know, we, we talk together very much. And then, you know, because it's followed the history of the church in Nigeria, the Pentecostal church, and you'll hear the church is growing. The church is growing in numbers, but are they growing in spirituality? That's the question. And if we forget that the reason why Jesus came, he was manifested that he might take away our sins. Well, just do church, convention, conference, camp meeting, whatever. And it will just be a time of getting to pull crowds together. And the crowd will not know head or tail of what Christ came for. But I think those of us who are here, if others don't know, we ought to know. And this is the very foundation that we need to understand that Christ came to save sinners, to pull people, to rescue people out of their sins. And it says over here, he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. In verse 6, whosoever abideth in him, tell me the rest sinneth not sinneth not always remember that when temptation comes whosoever abideth in him sinneth not 
whosoever sinners has not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin, tell me the rest, is of the devil. He that committeth sin. Whether the person committing the sin is a little person, a young person, a teenager, it's the same thing. God doesn't excuse. God doesn't have one Bible for the adults and then one Bible for the young people. One Bible for the Africans and one Bible for the Europeans. Have you seen that yet? <laughs> you know, sometimes when I come like this and I read from, you know, Genesis and I just go on, some people are thinking this man is coming from Africa. Does he think that he's going to preach here like he preaches in Africa? And does he want to give us the whole Bible in one single conference? Do you have another heaven to go from the people are in Africa? Is it not the same heaven? Is it not the same holiness? Is this not the same Bible? Are we going to have another watered down gospel here? And then when we get back to Africa, it's only when we can preach the real thing. If we're going to go to the same heaven, and if the same Christ died for everyone, and the same Bible has been given to us, if it's the same blood of Jesus that washes and cleanses and purifies away from sin, if it's the same church all over, the church of God, and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, are we not going to be exposed to the same thing? Of course, the same thing. And that's why you'll find, whether I'm in America or in UK or in Europe or anywhere, I don't change my style. I don't change what I believe. I don't change the word of God. We preach the same thing. And I take the same time I need to take. And I also lead people into prayer. Because it's when you pray, you pray it in and then your life totally changes. That's the joy of ministry. And I pray that God will help you to lay this strong foundation in your personal life in Jesus' name. Give me a good, good amen. Yeah. You know, it's coming from Africa, I'm used to a good amen that, you know, wakes those who are sleeping up. I don't like an amen. You know, that says uh, amen. What are you going to stop? Praise, <laughs> praise the Lord. Are you getting something tonight? Say yes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We're looking at First John chapter three. In First John chapter three, verse eight, he that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For the for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not do what does not commit sin. For his seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this, the children of God are manifest. And the children of the devil, whosoever, anywhere, in any country, in any church, any denomination, whosoever does not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. I'm looking at First John chapter 4 verse 4. Ye of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he. That's the secret of our victory. That's the very foundation of the real Christian life. It says over here, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 4. First John chapter 5, we're looking at verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. That's a triumphant life. Overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? In verse 18, it says, we know. I pray you'll know this one. 
You'll know it not only in the head, you'll know it in the heart. You'll know it not because we see it, you'll know it because we have experienced it. You will know it because Christ has made this real in your very life. And it says, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one touches him not. That's a victory a real child of God has. Now, now that we understand, now that we know what the triumphant life is all about, and we have this scriptural perception of the triumphant life, what's the power? How can it be? How can a person have that kind of triumphant life, victorious life? The life that has victory over sin, over self, and over Satan. We're going to point number two, the spiritual power for a triumphant life. Spiritual power for a triumphant life. If you, as you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Reading from verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus Christ. That's the power. The power of God in man. The power residing in the believer. The born again believer. That gives us the strength. Spiritual strength to be able to have and to live. This overcoming triumphant victorious life. Ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. He is the one that grants us the power to have that victory in our lives. In John chapter 1 verse 12. John chapter 1. Reading verse 12. But... As many as received him. Notice that not received it. It's not just receiving a doctrine. Receiving a dogma. Receiving an ideology. You receive Christ. It says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man opens the door, Door, then I will come in to him. When he comes in, he comes in in his victory, in his triumph, in his power. He comes in with everything that he has. And he has the power to overcome the devil in our lives. To overcome sin in our lives. And to grant us constant victory. And he says, as many as received him, he gave what? He gave power. He doesn't give weakness. He doesn't give timidity. He doesn't give fear. And doesn't give, you know, this propensity to always yield to sin. He gives the power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. That's what he gives. And as you come today, if you have not come before, he'll give you that power. And then as we pray, then it gives us that same power when we pray. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28. Isaiah 40, verse 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is he weary. There is no searching of his understanding. Verse 29, he giveth what? Power. He giveth power to the faith. When we come to Christ, if we truly come, if we really come, if we come with faith, and we come with great expectation that what God has done for all the people that went in generations gone by, that God is able to do the same thing today because he says, I am God, I change not. And Jesus Christ, who is our Savior, he changes not. And Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If we believe that and we come to the Lord, he says, he giveth power to the faith. And to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. Then in verse 31, it says, but they, they that do what? 
Tell me out loud. That's why the early church was strong, mighty, and powerful. If you look at Acts, don't open it, just say Acts chapter 1, you'll find the people were in one accord, they prayed, and they really prayed. If you find Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, they waited on the Lord, what were they doing before the Holy Ghost came? Praying. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 3, when that miracle happened, what did they do? They were going to the house of prayer. And then they saw that man, silver and gold, have I none, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up. And then he rose up. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 4, what, what were they doing? They were praying. And they so prayed that the place was shaking where they were. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 5, again, it's still the power of God being manifested because of prayer. And then you find Stephen having that kind of power and having that kind of uh, the, radiance, uh, the radiance of the glory of God. Why? Because he was a man of prayer. And then you find Acts of the Apostles chapter 9, prayer. The page. And in chapter 10, it was prayer. And if the church is going to have power today, the power to live a victorious life, the church must pray. And every individual in the church must pray. And if you come to a conference like this, this is the best place to pray. And the easiest place to pray. When we're all together, we're not doing any other thing but praying. They that wait upon the Lord will wait upon the Lord. And it says over here, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and they will not do what? They will not faint. That tells us then the spiritual power available in Christ. Spiritual power available when we come to the Lord and we really wait upon the Lord and then we pray and then a power within us will be able to make us do the will of God and do everything that ought to be done. We're going to be victorious. I said we're going to be victorious. In Philippians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 13. Philippians chapter 2 verse 13. In Philippians 2 13, for it is God which walketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It is God when you have that God on your side. And when Christ comes to live and he lives mighty in you. It seems it seem that helps us to be what we ought to be and to do what we ought to do. And to live the victorious life, the triumphant life. That's the power that makes us overcome all the things in the world. In Philippians chapter 4, I'm looking at verse 13. Philippians chapter 4 verse 13. I can do how many things? All things, no matter the challenge and no matter the temptation, no matter the hurdle I need to jump and then I need to overcome, no matter the mountain I need to climb, no matter the temptation I ought to resist, and no matter the kind of victory I ought to have in any situation, I can do all things.